Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. Hare Krishna Prabhu. My obeisances to you, all glories to Prabhupada. We can begin, Prabhu. Recording in progress. Yes, Maharaj. Om Jnana Tamarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksur Militanye Natas Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namine Namaste Sarasati Devi Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shanyavadi Paschatya Deshatarine Vanchakaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patitanam Pavanibhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So I think before we go on to chapter number 21 I'd like to hear some of you, who, did you, who, did you particularly like some of the analogies which were presented there in that previous chapter? Was there a, a particular analogy which caught your attention, Jalangi Maharaji? From yes, Guru Maharaj. I especially like the analogy mentioned in chapter 20, verse 15, the mountain analogy. So when there is torrent of rain, the mountain is not shaken, but cleansed. So whatever adversities we are facing actually elevates ourselves. That's the analogy I like the best, impressed me the most. Okay, very good. Thank you. What about Ramakrishna Prabhu? Maharaj. I like the particular uh, analogy of uh, the kings collecting the taxes. <laughs> yes. Why did you like that so much? Uh, because that, that actually serves the real purpose. Just like how the waters are gathered and meets the clouds and then it returns back again as rain for the benefit of everybody. So the idea being the kings must do the same for the benefit of the citizens. Hmm. Do you think it's actually possible or is it just theoretical? No, it's very much possible if the leaders take to Krishna consciousness seriously. Mm -hmm. The governments today, how are they doing? Well, they may not be fully Krishna conscious, but at least there is some idea that they want to do some welfare. So. Partly it is going on, but what we see around is a great amount of corruption. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Prabhu. Thank you. Anybody else out there who would like to contribute? Tell me something. What they, which particular analogy which they felt was very interesting? Maharaj, may I speak? Yes, please. So I like the analogy of the glowworms in the night. <laughs> Uh, which uh, are trying to replace the moon and the stars. <clears throat> so, as compared to the various pseudo-religionist and the atheistic uh, people who try to get some attention in Kali Yuga and divert the attention of the people, uh, while the actual devotees are like uh, the moons and stars, uh, and sometimes when the sky becomes clear, then the path also becomes clear. Those two analogies are connected. So that's good analogy for preaching because uh, people are uh, so much attracted to various things and it's a very powerful analogy which can tell them the reality of uh, their attraction and, and try to divert their mind to Krishna consciousness. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, certainly 
a memorable analogy, the glow worms, <laughs> and those sects which are like glow worms become prominent in the Kali Yuga. Yeah, maybe we'll hear from another one, Mataji, more. Can I, Maharaj? Yes, please, Mataji. Uh, I like the sixth verse, uh, Maharaj, where the, the flashing of lightning and then the great clouds are shaken. So just like merciful people who the clouds gave their lives. So this was reminding me of Srila Prabhupada, you know, for the good of the world, how Srila Prabhupada, uh, he was so comfortable in Vrindavan, but yet he gave up that uh, comfortable life just to save all of us. Uh, so that's the verse uh, I was just thinking about. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. So, like the, like the, the lightning, is it? The, no, the lightning, it shakes away the clouds and then the clouds, they give up their uh, oh, lives. they give up the rain, yeah. The, yeah. Mm -hmm. Pour the water on the land. Yeah. Give people relief from the scorching heat. Okay. Just like merciful people. So Srila Prabhupada extinguished the blazing fire of our material existence. Yeah. Poured the rain of mercy on us. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. All right. So then we'll go ahead to the next chapter, which is chapter 21. Hmm. Let's see. Oh, gosh. Some of these things need to go out. Are you okay? Are you able to see this? Uh, I put the text on the board in case you don't have it on the screen. Yeah. Okay. The, so the title is the Gopis glorify the song of Krishna's flute, or simply we'll call it the Venu Gita. Okay. So. Uh, would somebody like to read here something, read the first couple of paragraphs here from this uh, summary of the chapter to introduce to us what we're going to hear? Yes, Guru Maharaj, shall I read Please. from the very beginning? Please, Jalangi Maharaji, thank you. This chapter describes how Lord Sri Krishna entered the enchanting forest of Vrindavan upon the arrival of autumn and the praises the young cowherd girl sung when they heard the vibration of his flute. As Lord Krishna, Lord Balarama and their cowherd friends entered the forest to graze the cows, Krishna began playing his flute. The gopis heard the enchanting flute sung and understood that Krishna was entering the forest. Then they narrated to each other the Lord's various activities. The gopis declared, to see Lord Krishna playing his flute while taking the cows to pasture is the highest perfection for the eyes. What pious activities has this flute performed that enable him to freely drink the nectar of Sri Krishna's lips, a blessing we covered girls find difficult to achieve Hearing the sound of Krishna's flute, the peacocks dance, and all the other creatures become stunned when they see them. Demigoddesses traveling through the sky in their airplanes are vexed by Cupid, and their garments become loose. The ears of the cow stand on end as they drink the nectar of this flute song, and their calves simply stand stunned. The milk they have been drinking from their mother's udders still in their mouths. The birds take shelter of the branches of trees and close their eyes, listening to the song of Krishna's flute with rapt attention. The flowing rivers become perturbed by conjugal attraction for Krishna and stopping their flow, 
embrace Krishna's lotus feet with the arms of their waves, while the clouds serve as parasols to shade Krishna's head from the hot sun. The aborigine women of the Shabara race, seeing the grass stained by the red kumkum adorning the Lord's lotus feet, smear this vermilion powder upon their breasts and faces to elevate the distress created by Cupid. Govardhan Hill offers grass and various kinds of fruits and bulbous roots in worship of Lord Sri Krishna. All the non-moving living beings take on the characteristics of moving creatures and the moving living beings become stationary. These things are all very wonderful. Well, thank you very much, Chulangi. Very nice. Uh, so th this is our publisher summary of the chapter. This 21 describes how the gopis are afflicted by their love for Krishna, hearing the flute. That's why it's called, of course, Venugita. They, they, they offer the but they not only praise the flute, the gopis of Vrind will hear the praise of the flute, but will also hear the praise of Vrindavan. And then they'll praise the different animals, the female animals, the doles especially, and the cows. And uh, they'll praise also, we had about the female devatas, the goddesses, <laughs> how they were also stunned with love for Krishna. So this will all be described here in this chapter. 21 is the Venu Gita, 31 will be Gopi Gita. Gopi Gita is probably more famous. The meter which the Gopi Gita is written in is very wonderful and devotees like to sing it, particularly during Kartik. We often hear the devotees sing it, but any time can be sung. We have some people who come to our temple in Hong Kong, some ladies there, they come and every day they sit and they sing the whole Gopi Gita. But this is Venu Gita. I don't know if any of you are familiar with reciting it. Anybody? Any of the ladies recite the, Gop the Venu Gita regularly? It's maybe not uh, the easiest uh, meter to recite. Anyway, uh, let's begin. Who would like to read the first verse? Let's try to read the Sanskrit also. And we'd like to hear the Sanskrit. There's only uh, some 20 verses in this chapter. It's a small chapter. So I think we have time. We can read the, if someone can read the Sanskrit to us, someone who's good in reciting Sanskrit, who has a nice uh, ability in that. Srinivas, you want to do it? Yes, Maharaj. Sri <clears throat> Sukhavacha. Ittam sarat swacha jalam padma kara sugandina nyavisad vayunavatam sago gopala ko chuta. Yes, very nice. Go ahead, read the translation. Pradev Goswami said, Thus the Vrindavan forest was filled with transparent autumnal uh, waters and cooled by breezes perfumed with the fragrance of lotus flowers growing in the clear lakes. The infallible Lord, accompanied by his cows and cowherd boyfriends, entered that Vrindavan forest. Thank you, Prabhu. So in the previous chapter, we heard about the rainy season and how then after the rainy season, then came the autumn season. And we heard about the beauty of the autumn season there in Vrindavan. So now it's also the autumn season and we're hearing about how Lord Krishna performs his pastimes in the forest. We're hearing about how the gopis actually view Krishna how they understand Krishna performing his pastimes in the forest. As he's, uh, the gopis, of course, they're in the village, but 
they have the desire to see Krishna's pastimes as they are in the forest. So Sukadeva Goswami was describing the autumn season in the previous chapter and now he's going to describe these pastimes about the song of the flute, the song of the flute or the, the Venu Gita, which is also related to this description of autumn. So the first couple of verses are describing the beauty of Vrindavan forest and Krishna's entrance into the forest with the, the sweetness of autumn. And we can see in the first verse how Vrindavan is described, that the beauty is in relation to two aspects. One is the autumnal waters and the other is the breezes the pleasant breezes which are there in the forest, as well as the transparent autumnal waters. Because after the heavy rain, then there's a water, pools of water everywhere. So this adds to the beauty of the Vrindavan forest, these two aspects. The breeze, the Acharyas tell us that uh, Sukadeva Goswami, in describing the breeze, he, he used single, singular. He didn't talk about breezes. He did, it wasn't the plural, but it was singular. So that, that, that is to indicate that the breeze was not harsh, that the breeze was gentle. That's what you want. You know, in winter time, in some parts of the world, it can be very cold. I know in the UK, in the, in the, we have, a, well, most of the year, they have these cold winds coming off the Atlantic because the UK is an island. So it's right at the side of the Atlantic and there's often these big storms coming off the Atlantic. So a lot of wind. And then similarly also in Russia and places like that, they have very strong winds coming from the north, coming from the Arctic, coming down. But here in Vrindavan, in the autumn season at least, in the autumn season, there's a breeze. And that breeze is perfumed with the fragrance of the lotus flowers which grow in the lakes. So the, the breeze carries the fragrance of the lotus flowers. So we can understand something of the beauty of the Vrindavan forest in the autumn season. And we're told, the infallible Lord, accompanied by his cows and cowherd boyfriends, entered the Vrindavan forest. So we can, our, our minds can be attracted to the beauty of that wonderful forest. Okay, so then we, if, let me go into the next verse, because this is the first verse, just the introduction. So who would like to read the second verse for us and have a go at the Sanskrit also? Maharaj, can I read? Please, Prabhu. Thank you. Suchumita vanadadi sushmi bringa Vijatula dusta sarasharin mahidram Madupati ravaga yacharayanga Sahapashupala balas jukuja venum Oh, very nice, yes. You're a master. Thank you. The lakes, rivers and hills of Vrindavan resounded with the sounds of maddened bees and flocks of birds moving about the flowering trees. In the company of the cowherd boys and Balaram, Madhupati Sri Krishna entered that forest and while herding the cows, he began to vibrate his flute. Thank you, Prabhu. Very nice. 
All right, so the lakes, rivers and hills resounded with the sound of maddened bees and flocks of birds moving about the flowering trees. So more descriptions of Vrindavan, you see. Nature is there, in the different living entities, the birds and the bees and the flowering trees, all add to the beauty of Vrindavan. And then there's the lakes and rivers and hills also. So it makes the whole scene very wonderful. And in the company of the cowherd boys, there is Balaram and also Madhupati. Madhupati being the name of Lord Krishna. Or who who would like to tell us something about the significance of this name, Madhupati? How do you understand this name, Madhupati? There's different interpretations, different acharyas have given us different meanings. One acharya, the one I read, was, a, was talking about Madhu as being spring and Pati being the master. Pati can also, like the husband, but he, it can also mean the, the, the controller, the in charge. Or, so Lord Krishna is the personification of the spring season. So he is Madhu Pati. And it said that when Lord Krishna appeared, that although it was autumn, it was actually like spring because all the different flowers which usually bloom in the springtime, somehow they were all blooming in the autumn season by the arrangement of Krishna. That Lord Krishna is the controller of the, the, this, these different things through his different potencies and he arranges for the, the beauty of the Vrindavan forest to supplement all of his pastimes. I think when we heard, do you remember reading about the birth of Krishna? And we were told that the birth of Krishna, what was it, what, what particular season did Lord Krishna take birth in? What month was it? What month was that? Badra Mas. Badra, Mas. Okay, thank you. Yes, Badra Mas. So, how was the weather at that time? It's a rainy season. It's a rainy season. Yes, right. It's a rainy season. But when Lord and when Lord Krishna appeared, how was the how was Vrindavan? How was it? The, the forest? How was Golok? Uh, how was Goku? How were all these places? It's like spring. Yes, it was like spring. That's how it's described. It said it was like spring, although it was actually uh, uh, it was the month of Bhadra, it was a rainy season, but still it was like spring. Because Krishna enjoys the beauty of spring, the different flowers which bloom in the spring season are most pleasing to Lord Krishna. So this was one interpretation of Madhupati, but there are some others. Maybe you can remember, you can think of some. Right? What do we, what's the meaning of the word Madhu? Common meaning of Madhu? Honey. Honey, right. So do you know some pastimes of Krishna with the honey? Or what was happening? Maharaji? You don't know? There's a conversation between uh, Radharani and Krishna. Yes, can you tell us more? Uh, when Krishna comes to meet Radharani and uh, she's not opening the door, he's giving various names. And then Krishna Stepa says Hari. Then she says, Oh, Hari is lion. I'm not going to open the door for Hari. Then she says, uh, he says, I'm uh, Madhupati, oh, you're the king of the bees. The bees is going to sting me, so I'm not going to open the door, she says. Oh. <laughs> so like that, uh, he keeps giving different names and 
she keeps interpreting them as different names. He means one thing, but he, she takes it as another thing. Okay. That's time. Yes. We also know some more, there's some more pastimes as well about Krishna with the, uh, with the bees, right? Can I say something? Please, Prabhu. Uh, there was a king in this dynasty called Madhu, uh, who was actually father of Vrishni. So that is also one reason why Krishna is called Madhupati. Like Ramchandra is called Raghupati, so Krishna is called Madhupati. Ah, yes. Uh -huh. So that's a very good reason, right? Uh, as may I add something? Yes. And as uh, Atul Krishna Prabhu said that, so Mathura was previously known as Madhupuri. And he being the lord of Mathura is also known by the name of Madhupati. But of course, this pastime is before Krishna reaches uh, Mathura. So, but in Mathura Leela, he is also addressed as Madhupati. Okay. In Mathura Leela, he is also Madhupati. Yes, and there was a pastime when Lord Krishna was sitting with Srimati Radharani when a bumblebee appeared. And Srimati Radharani became a little afraid of the bee. But then he said, Madhu's gone. Madhu's gone. And she thought Madhu, she thought Krishna had gone. Although Krishna was sitting beside her. When they chased away the bee, they announced Madhu is gone. And she was worried that Krishna had left her. So Krishna is Madhu. And, and we saw also in earlier in tenth canto you had Srimati Radharani having her uh, talk with the bumblebee. I think have you al you've already covered that. Where Radharani is talking to where oh, oh no maybe you haven't come that you've got not, you haven't come to that yet it will come later. When Uddhava brings the letter to Vrindavan to give to the gopis at that time a bee appears. And Radharani begins to talk to the bumblebee and address the bumblebee as being an unreliable servant of an unreliable master. And then the bumblebee disappears and then Srimati Radharani becomes worried that it's gone to tell Krishna all, all of her complaints. So like this Madhu, there's a lot of connection with Krishna. So Madhu Pati is a very appropriate name for Lord Krishna. So here in this pasta, here in this uh, second verse, we're hearing about the beauty of Vrindavan and how Lord Krishna enters the forest herding the cows, playing his flute. So Lord Krishna skillfully blended the sound of his flute with the lovely sounds of Vrindavan's multicolored birds. Thus an irresistible heavenly vibration was created. We can just imagine the mixing of the sound of Lord Krishna's flute along with all the beautiful sounds of the colorful birds there in Vrindavan. We do see a lot of birds there in Vrindavan. You know, you, you, we see a lot of parrots there. Usually they're green, usually, most of the parrots, but there are many other colourful birds there. So that's one of the beauties of the forests, that you can see all of these things. And certainly in the times of Lord Krishna, there was an abundance of all of these different birds moving around and taking advantage of the trees, the flowering trees. The trees are the homes for the birds, of course. 
I even see, I can see here in Mayapur how we have many birds here. When we move the trees and the birds certainly feel disturbed when knocking down trees, it's not such a, not a good thing to do. Prabhupada didn't like us to do that, he got very upset. I remember one time there was a tree growing on the land at the temple, this was in Dallas in USA and there was a tree growing there inside the compound of the temple. So the tree was actually growing in a way it was going to grow, it was a, a, going to obstruct the building. So the devotee cut it, cut it and when Prabhupada saw it he was very disturbed and Prabhupada told, he said, you will suffer. He said, you cut the trees, you will suffer. So Prabhupada was very concerned like that, that we should take care for the trees and not cut them unnecessarily. There was a nice tree, a tamal tree, which grew in the courtyard of the Krishna Balaram temple. So when we first got that land, they had to decide whether or not to cut the tree. And Prabhupada asked them, no, just keep it. And the tree grew so nicely, it became a very important part of the temple. Everyone appreciated the beauty of that tree. In course of time, the tree left the body. Now it's been replaced with another tree. But still, it, it gave a lot of association. So Krishna and the cowherd boys entered the forest of Vrindavan. Krishna is playing the flute. Uh, the, we should understand that it's only Krishna playing the flute. And so the Venu Gita song is coming from Krishna's flute only. It's not coming from anyone else's flute. We, we, should, we should note that point, that although sometimes they talk about Lord Balaram, generally we think of Lord Balaram as being Haladhara. He's the carrier of the plough. Krishna plays the carrier of the flute, but Balaram generally we, we have him carrying the plough. So Lord Balaram, he's encouraging us to do agriculture, and Lord Krishna is encouraging us with cow protection. But the two lords are together. Okay, we'll go ahead. Text number three. Who would like to read for us? May I read Maharaj? Please, Prabhu. Uh, Vrajastriya Ashwatya Venugitam Smarodayam Paschit Paroksham Krishnasya Swaswapigya Anvavarnyam Yes. Yes, translation. When the young ladies in the cowherd village of Raja heard the song of Krishna's flute, which arouses the influence of Cupid, some of them privately began describing Krishna's qualities to their intimate friends. All right, thank you, Prabhu. So it's mentioned here, young ladies. So we should understand there are different gopis there. Now not all of the gopis are young ladies. There's young ladies and there's older ladies. Hmm. I'm just looking in the translation to see the word meaning there. Is it actually mentioned young ladies there? <laughs> it doesn't actually mention there. It just simply says some of them. Anyway, it's understood that these ladies who are feeling like that, feeling influence, the, under the influence of Cupid, that this is going to be the younger ladies who are going to be influenced by Cupid. The older gopis, they will be more vatsauyaras. They will be more in the mood of motherly affection towards Krishna. But the young gopis, they're influenced by Cupid. So when they hear the sound of Krishna's flute, the gopis, they become affected. And some of them begin describing Krishna's qualities to their friends. So this is the effect of 
Krishna's flute that awakens remembrance of Lord Krishna and one remembering Lord Krishna, one wants to narrate and describe his different qualities, his different experiences, the realizations which they have about Lord Krishna. All right, we'll go ahead. We, 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 we're still in the introductory stage of this chapter. Anyway, the young ladies, they heard the sound of Krishna's flute. It awakens influence of Cupid and they begin to talk about Krishna to their intimate friends. They're not going to talk to just anybody about their about the influence of Cupid, their loving feelings. That's going to be for only intimate friends, you know. They're not going to reveal that to everyone. They definitely don't want their mothers-in-law or sisters-in-law to know about these things because some men, some of the most, many of the gopis are already married, so they're very cautious what they say. Okay, go ahead. Text number four. Who could read? Yes. Translation. The cowherd girls began to speak about Krishna, but when they remembered his activities, O King, the power of Cupid disturbed their minds, and, and thus they could not speak. <laughs> okay, so this is the result of the gopis' love for Krishna that they had so much strong affection for Lord Krishna that when they remembered Lord Krishna and his activities, because of their loving feeling for Krishna, remember that this love for which the gopis have for Krishna is not like the love of Kubja, it's a pure love. So the, but the, the power of Cupid disturbed their minds. They could not speak. And some, sometimes it said, some Acharyas described that sometimes the gopis would faint even on hearing the sound of Krishna's flute and trying to speak and remembering him. It would, they would just faint. And, how, and the only way they could be revived is when Lord Krishna would personally come there and touch them with his lotus feet. And through the touch of his lotus feet, he'd bring them back to their consciousness. So this, of course, is the, the very exalted love which the gopis have for Krishna, their prema bhakti. They have achieved that goal of life. And although they wanted to speak about Krishna, but they, they couldn't, they couldn't get the words out. They just didn't know what, how to say. All right, so. Now we're going ahead, text number five, and it's a very beautiful verse, and, and it's a very well-known verse, actually, text number five. I think this is the verse which was recited when they went to the home of Nandanacharya. Lord Chaitanya brought all the devotees to meet Lord Nityananda for the first time. So, Lord Chaitanya wanted all the devotees to understand the position of Lord Nityananda. And so he asked Srivas that, please, Srivas, recite a verse about Vrindavan. So at that time, Srivas recited this particular verse. And on hearing this particular verse sung by Srivas, then Lord Nityananda collapsed on the floor and his bhava was completely awakened and he rolled on the floor in ecstasy and he covered the floor in tears and his tears. So everyone could see his exalted position and understood that he was really a great devotee. So when we recite this verse, I hope none of you are going to roll on the floor in ecstasy and awaken your bhava. Please, but if you do, you have to control it, right? Prabhupada 
would say that, you know, if you're experiencing this bhava, love of God, what should you do? Right? You have an awakening of bhava, you have a remembrance of Lord Krishna, as it's described here. The gopis are remembering Lord Krishna entering the forest, so your love for Krishna is aroused and you're feeling ecstasy, you're feeling bhava. What are we supposed to do? Yes? Can't do much, Maharaj. <laughs> <laughs> Can't do much. You have to, what should you, do you know, what, you, what did Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati do when he had the awakening of bhava? Generally what he would do, he would get up and go out of the temple. He wouldn't remain in the temple, he'd get out of the temple and go somewhere, just go to his room. And similarly sometimes Prabhupada also had, yes? Somebody, someone wants to say something there? When Srila Prabhupada was in Gorakhpur, Prabhupada also had an, some, at one point something happened in the course of the program and Prabhupada also had an awakening of bhava. And Prabhupada became stunned, and devotees didn't know what to do. So then they chanted, they began kirtan. And a, few, a minute or two later, Prabhupada came back to external consciousness. Another time also, Prabhupada was in Atlanta and he saw the deities of Gornitai there and he was very captivated by the beauty of the deities and his bhava was also awakened. He was stunned for a moment. So this is the power of spiritual sound vibration. When we hear these verses, then our remembrance of Lord Krishna is aroused. So who would like to chant verse number five for us? Anyone familiar? It's... Maharaj, I can chant the verse. Yes, you can, Prabhu. Oh, wonderful, please. <laughs> Oh, very nice, yes. Have you memorized it all? Yes, Maharaj, I have recited it many times. Oh, <laughs> wonderful. So, you can read the translation. Wearing a peacock feather ornament upon his head, blue karnikar flower, flowers on his ears, a yellow garment as brilliant as gold, and the Vajayanti garland, Lord Krishna exhibited his transcendental form as the greatest of dancers as he entered the forest of Vrindavan, beautifying it with the marks of his footprints. He filled the holes of his flute with the nectar of his lips, and the cowherd boys sang his glories. Thank you. Very nice. So this is a very wonderful verse, very uh, graphic description of Lord Krishna entering the forests of Vrindavan. His, the gopis are describing, or Sukadev Goswami is rather describing for us, wearing a peacock feather ornament upon his head. Now that's something which we will uh, sometimes discuss. Should the deities wear peacock feathers on their head? Should Lord Chaitanya and Lord Nichananda have peacock feathers on their head? There is something of a controversy whether or not to put a peacock feather on the head of Lord Chaitanya. Anybody have any knowledge on this? Who is worshipping Gornitai? Mars? 
Yes. Yeah, the, uh, I can I can only uh, narrate the position of DC, DT Worship Ministry on this, and that is that there is no offense in uh, putting the peacock feather on Garnita's uh, head, especially Mahaprabhu's head, because we are worshiping Mahaprabhu as Krishna, not as devotee. That's the because that's the counter argument that uh, Mahaprabhu came in the mood of a devotee. So then, how do you put the uh, picking feather on his on his head? So the answer to that is uh, as per the Panchratra system, we are worshiping Mahaprabhu as Krishna. So then, the peacock feather is not uh, uh, is, is not inappropriate. So you can put better peacock feather on Mahaprabhu's head. Okay, that's the deity ministry's position on the issue, is it? Yeah. Yes, yes, Maharaj. And what about Lord Nityananda? I mean, sometimes, sometimes you can. That's there. Like sometimes you can, but not always. Sometimes you can. Uh huh. Yes. Yes. Sometimes there's controversies on these issues. Some people. Uh, I think what was Gorgovinda Maharaj didn't like to see peacock feather on Lord Chaitanya, was it? He said Lord Chaitanya's mood is different. That we didn't want. Yes. yes. Yeah, he said if we put a peacock feather on his head, then we're disturbing his mood. He's come in the mood as a devotee, and if you put a peacock feather on his head, then. That's not his mood. Anyways, Prabhu said, deity ministry worship, say that we're worshipping Lord Chaitanya as Krishna, not just as the devotee. So, different understandings. It depends on how you worship, what is your mood in worshipping the Lord. And then he's, he's got this Karnikara flower on his ear. What exactly is this flower, the blue Karnikara flower? Have we got these? Are they growing in many places? I, I'm not very sure what it is. No one's ever showed me this is a Karnikara flower. Are you familiar? Anybody know? Do you have these flowers? Nobody knows. No response. Okay. And then a yellow garment as brilliant as gold. Is the Lord only dressed in yellow? Does he wear any other colors? I was reading that uh, the Acharyas say that he's dressed not only yellow, but also black and red. So it's very colourful, very colourful, he's yellow, black and red, and then of course Lord Balaram, he's in his blue, so he, he, he's very, very colourful, very attractive when he appears, how Lord Krishna's dress is, is very important. You know, you see all of these great personalities. They're very particular in material world, how they dress, their dressing is very important, it means a lot to them. Someone's a big politician or a, a, a big famous actor, actress or something, they'll be very careful how they dress and the appearance which they give. And so similarly, Lord Krishna entering the forest, Although he's a cowherd, he's the son of the king of the cowherds, the son of Nanda Maharaj, but when he enters into the forest, he's dressed in such an attractive manner that it, it is so pleasing to the gopis. It's so pleasing, not only to the gopis, it's pleasing to all the people of Braja. And then he has also this Vajayanti garland, so what is the nature of this garland, the Vajjayanti garland? Can someone tell me? Marajis, you must know. The flower never uh, dies, it's always fresh and fragrant. Is it any special color? I don't know, Maharaj. 
Maharaj, can I add something? Yes, please, Prabhu. Generally, Vaijayanti Mala is uh, made up of five different colored flowers. There are five different colors in that, in, and then also Tulsi Manjari. And it comes up to the knees of the Lord. Right, right, yes. Yeah, it should be f five colors. And as Prabhu said, there should be Tulsi Manjaris. And it should be certain length also. It should be down to the knees of the Lord. This is the, generally how we describe the Vajayanti garland. And the Lord is decorated with that. And then Lord Krishna exhibits his transcendental form as the greatest of dancers as he enters the forest of Vrindavan. He's the greatest of dancers. What, where did we see Lord Krishna dance? Have we, you know, up, up to now in this 10th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, have we seen, have we seen examples of Lord Krishna dancing? Kaliya Sorry? On the hoods of Kaliya. Yes, right. That's what I was thinking, right. On the hoods of Kaliya. Definitely. The Lord is there dancing on the hoods of Kaliya. He showed himself to be a wonderful dancer. How expert you'd have to be to dance on the hoods of Kaliya, kicking down the hoods of Kaliya and at the same time dancing. <laughs> so <laughs> incredible. So this is Lord Krishna. And then also, as the best of dancers, he enters the forest of Vrindavan, beautifying it with the marks of his footprints. What are the special features of his footprints? The footprints of the Lord have special signs on them. There's some particularly prominent. There are actually, I think, is it 19 or something, marks? Yes, my 19. 19. Yes. So, can you tell me just one or two of them, a couple of them, something? Lightning. Yes, the lightning, yeah, the thunder, the lightning or the thunderbolt, yeah? There is gold, there is chariot, there is half Yes, yes there's a gold. Uh, and do you know the significance of these things? Yes. What, is the, what is the significance of the God? The God signifies that it actually controls the senses of the devotee. The lotus feet of the Lord is able to control the senses of the devotee. And just as the elephant is controlled by the God, uh, and the devotee's senses are also controlled by the God and they are led in the proper direction. And the senses include the mind also, particularly the mind is controlled by the goad. Just like the elephant is difficult to control, but with the goad, even the big elephant can be controlled. So the same way, our mind, very difficult to control. But by taking shelter of the lotus feet of Krishna, our mind can also be controlled. And then the, the, the lightning bolt or thunderbolt? It uh, destroys the mountains of sins of devotees. Yes, right. Mountains of sin which is in our heart from many lives in the material world. So the thunderbolt can s smash that to pieces, remove the pride, remove the false ego by taking shelter of the lotus feet of Lord Krishna. Okay. Yeah, th there's, a, there's an interesting little booklet which has all the different marks on Lord Krishna's lotus feet and we're told the significance of each of them. And by taking shelter of the Lord's lotus feet, then we can get that purification of consciousness. So Lord Krishna beautifies the forest of Vrindavan with his lotus footprints. And the, we're, we're told also there's a difference between, there's something special about Vrindavan, that these footprints are there. 
but there's no footprints in Vaikuntha. Why are there no footprints in Vaikuntha? This is something unique to this Vrindavan, that in Vrindavan the Lord leaves his footprints everywhere. But there's no footprints in Vaikuntha. Lord wears footwear. Yes, Never wear. right. The Lord wears his slippers in Vaikuntha. <laughs> He's got his slippers on, so there's no footprints. There's some Prabhupada pastime, maybe you've heard it, there's a Prabhupada pastime. A devotee was following Prabhupada and he was seeing the footprints of all the devotees, but somehow when Prabhupada was walking, there were no footprints. He couldn't understand it. And everyone else was leaving their footprints on the ground, but everywhere Prabhupada walked, he walked behind, there was no footprints from Prabhupada. <laughs> It's just amazing, Prabhupada's mystic power. All right, so this is such a very beautiful description of Lord Krishna entering the forest of Vrindavan. And then he filled the holes of his flute with the nectar of his lips. So the flute, we may say, oh, the flute is no good, it's got holes in it. You know, this, what's, what kind of flute is this? It's got holes in it. Huh? It's not a very good flute. But Lord Krishna fills the holes of the flute with nectar from his lips. And then that nectar from his lips, which enters in the holes of the flute, that enters into the ears of the gopis. And from the ears of the gopis, it enters into their hearts. And this way, the love of the gopis is expanded more and more, their remembrance of Lord Krishna. And then finally, the cowherd boys sing the glories. The cowherd boys are also very devoted to Lord Krishna. They're very attached to Lord Krishna. Every morning, as soon as, as soon as they wake up, as soon as they're, as, as the, before the morning, before the daylight comes, they wake up and they're anxious to go, to be with Krishna and they're going to go out into the forest to be with Krishna and spend their day with Lord Krishna in the forest. So the cowherd boys, they love to be with Krishna. Krishna is their life and soul. He's the center of their existence. They will go in the forest together. And of course, this is the greatest pain for the gopis. Because the gopis, they can't go into the forest. They have to stay back. They will hear, they will hear Lord Krishna call the cowherd boys. Where are you all now? Sridam, Sudama, Subal, Vrishaba, Rishaba, where are you now? Let's go. We have to go into the, it's time to go in the, the forest. The cows are waiting for us. They want to go into the forest and they will come running. And of course, they, they bring their lunch boxes with them and they go off for the day into the forest. And and of course, as, as they go into the forest, Lord Krishna will be playing his flute, calling all the cows, and the cowherd boys will come, and the gopis, they will hear the sound of the flute. And when the gopis hear that sound of the flute, as it enters their ears, then they understand, oh, now Krishna's leaving, he's going into the forest. So this is the time of separation between Krishna and the gopis. And the gopis are greatly pained to think that Krishna is going off into the forest. They would like to go and be with Krishna, but they can't go. They're, they have their duties to perform. Some are married and have children and they have to take care of the cows and they have to turn the butter into yogurt 
and they have to do so many different chores and duties, they cannot just go and leave everything. But they, they go, they will come and watch. They'll watch Krishna go off into the forest. If you read the Brihad Bhagavat Amrita, it's described there, Sanatana Goswami describes in some detail there, how every day that the cowherd boys will go off into the forest, they'll go out from the village of Vrindavan into the forest, and the gopis will be greatly pained, and they will even follow for some distance. They want to follow Krishna into the forest. But after a certain distance, Krishna will tell them, Okay, now you go back. It's far enough. Now you go back. So in this way, the gopis have to go back to their homes. And they know Krishna's gone off to the forest with the cowherd boys. And they want to see the pastimes which Krishna's enjoying there in the forest with the other cowherd boys. Because in the forest, Krishna will be doing things which he can't do in the village. You know, when you're in the village, all the elders are there, the mothers and fathers and everything, the, and the husbands and so on. So they, they have to behave in a different manner. It's a different situation. But when, when they go into the forest, they enjoy. They have their kirtan. And they have singing and dancing. Just like sometimes the devotees, you know, when they're in the temple, you, you have your program. But sometimes you get away from the temple, you go off into the countryside and you have a program. And it's a very different mood. It's a very uh, relaxed mood. Without, you, you're not so conscious about others and you're more free to chant and to dance. And indeed Lord Krishna and Lord Balaram, they did. They enjoyed. Lord Krishna would play his flute and sometimes also he will sing. And they, in this way they will dance and they'll have wonderful kirtan. And Lord Krishna will say, can any of you sing like me? Lord Krishna will, will joke with the cowherd boys. They say, can any of you sing like me? Can any of you dance like me? <laughs> A little bit pride, you know, just joking words between Krishna and the cowherd boys. We are, he said, what, what can you do? You're just a cowherder. How can you do much? You can't do much. You're not very qualified. And this way Lord Krishna is enjoying the company of the cowherd boys and encouraging them also to dance and to sing the glories of Lord Krishna. So this is a very, very nice verse, this fifth verse, very, very beautiful. Gopis remembering all the transcendental qualities mentioned. Mm. Okay, we'll go ahead. Text number six talks about. Oh, who's like who'd like to read for us? Maras Devi. Please, Prabhu. Iti veenu ravam rajan sarva puta mano ram shukva vajastiya sarva varna yanto vire vire. Yes, thank you. Translation. O king, when the young ladies in the Raja heard the sound of Krishna's flute, which captivates the minds of all living beings, they all embraced one another and began describing it. Mm. Shall I read the purport also? Yeah, you can do. The word iti here indicates that after becoming speechless by remembering Krishna, the cowherd damsels then regained the composure and were thus able to ecstatically describe the sound of Krishna's flute. As few gopis began to exclaim, the other gopis realized that they shared the same ecstatic love within their hearts and all of them started embracing one another 
overwhelmed with conjugal love for young Krishna. Thank you, Prabhu. So just looking back at chapter, at verse number 5 also, we see Sukadeva Goswami began the description of Krishna's pastimes according to that mood of the gopis and according to their very deep love. And he's describing the different features of Krishna which stimulated that love of Krishna within the minds of the gopis. How Krishna uh, displayed his different charms just to increase the loving ecstasy of the gopis. You know, wearing these big garlands with five different colors of flowers and the dressing which he had as well and then the peacock feather on his turban on top of his head. And then his flute playing, of course, we know his flute playing is particularly significant, not only in this chapter, but Rupa Goswami selects four qualities of Lord Krishna which are unique to Krishna and which are not there in any other uh, devata, it's not there in Vishnu or Narayan, it's not there in Lord Shiva or Lord Brahma or anyone. There are four special qualities and one of them is Krishna's flute playing. That his flute playing is uh, so pleasing that it attracts people all over the creation. So the, the flute, although it was, we, we may think it's just some unconscious piece of wood, is it actually capable? to do so much, to have so much effect on others. But we should understand that that flute was not just some unconscious word, because when he's touched by the nectar of Lord Krishna's lips, then that flute becomes transcendental and life is brought into that flute. The non-living becomes living by the touch of Krishna. Krishna can put life into these objects. That is the nature of the spiritual world. Okay, so... And then also, the, another point about Vrindavan is that this was the place where Krishna felt his, it, it gave the greatest pleasure to his feet. Those of you who, you know, have you done Brajamandal Parikrama? Any of you? Have you been on the Parikrama in Vrindavan? Yes? No? Yes, Maharaj. You did it, Srivas Prabhu? Yes, yeah, Srinivas? Yeah, good. Yes? So when you go on Brajamandal, uh, Vrindavan Parikrama, Vrindavan Parikrama, then you go through the forest, you, you get to know, you know, the roads are not very easy. There's a lot of stones and thorns and things. And indeed, if you, when you read the Gopi Gita, you'll see there's a verse there where the gopis are lamenting about Krishna, that they're worried about his feet, that his feet must be affected by all the stones and thorns and pebbles there, and it's really bothering the mind of the gopis, that they're so concerned about Krishna's soft feet, because they know Krishna's feet are very soft and tender, and they wonder what will Krishna's, how Krishna's feet will be affected walking through these forests every day in Braja. But we're told here there's a, some special places in Braja which Krishna likes very much and that's where he, Krishna performs rasa dance. Look, if, you're going, if you're going to do rasa dance then you definitely want to be somewhere where there's good ground there, nice soft earth. You don't want to be dance, trying to dance where there's a lot of stones and thorns everywhere. That will be really painful, right? You know that. 
you're walking barefooted there on the parikrama as you're supposed to, then your feet really feel it. And if you try to dance and then there's a lot of stones and thorns, then it's going to be really pain, painful. And so Krishna, he likes partic particular areas where Rasa Mandala is. It's a special area where Krishna can dance with all the gopis and they don't feel they won't feel troubled. The, 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 the earth there is very nice, and it's very pleasant, favorable. Of course, Krishna is transcendental to these things, but still we should understand that these kind of considerations are going to be there for everyone. Krishna's body is completely spiritual. He's not going to be affected by stones or thorns or pebbles and so on. But the gopis, they're thinking like that. They're thinking about Krishna. They're not thinking about their own self. Their only thought is for Lord Krishna, how to please him, what makes him happy. This is the mood of the gopis, their pure love for Krishna. There's no consideration of their own self. Everything is done for Krishna. So when the gopis come for rasa dance, it's not for their pleasure, but it's to give pleasure to Krishna. Okay, so we're... We're on text number six, right? We're hearing about how the gopis, they embraced one another. Why? Again, it's the young ladies in Braja heard the sound of Krishna's flute, which captivates the minds of all living beings, right? Not just the gopis, all living beings. The denizens in heaven are attracted not only their wives, but also their husbands also. And the animals, and we will see later on as we go through this chapter, we will see the clouds, the rivers, the trees, they're all attracted to the beauty, to the sound of Lord Krishna's flute. It affects all living entities, and the higher planets as well. And then, we're told these gopis, they're the young ladies, they, they, they embrace one another and begin describing the sound of Krishna's flute. In other words, the gopis, they find another gopi who has a similar experience that the sound of Krishna's flute is is it, being experienced by her in a manner similar to this particular gopi. They find something in common. They find the gopis will find something in common with each other and they will re relate to each other. Oh, when you, hear, when you hear Krishna's flute, you feel like that? Oh, I also feel like that. It, it also affects me like that. I also feel that. Oh, do you feel that too? So this is a, the feeling which is being expressed here, this uh, likeness, a common understanding between the gopis. And in this way the two gopis will embrace each other. You know, sometimes you meet someone and you talk to them and, and you find you have something, you have exactly the same experience as they have. And it feels so good that, oh, you know, well, that's amazing. You know, I'm also, I also felt like that when I heard Krishna's flute. Did you feel like that? Oh, this is wonderful. And they, in this way, they embrace each other. So there's a loving exchange there between the gopis. Previously, we heard they couldn't speak, but now somehow, after, after some time, they're coming back to consciousness and they're beginning to talk to each other and they're telling about the sound of Krishna's flute, how it affects them. All right, we'll stop and have a break for 10 minutes to chant Gayatri. Thank you.
Okay. So we'll continue. We were on text number six, right? So we heard about the gopis embracing one another because they, they found they had some common emotions. So this is, this is an indication how there are actually groups there among the gopis. That they have their groups. And I, I did speak something about those groups yesterday. I think I touched on it briefly. I mentioned about how who the, some of the gopis were in their previous lives. Do you remember? I spoke... Yeah, yeah, right? The right, the Shruti-chari gopis and the sages from the Dandakaranya forest. And so these naturally, they would be like groups of gopis. But you have also different groups. You have, for example, you have... You have we heard the... the, the, the today also, and that we were speaking, that some of the gopis were elderly and they were more influenced by Vatsalya Prem rather than by conjugal and Madhurya Prem, you know. They, they were not influenced by Cupid, but they were influenced by the mood of being motherly to Krishna. Their Prema was in Vatsalya Ras. So the elderly gopis, like Mother Yashoda. Now Mother Yashoda, she's also Prema Bhakta, but she's in, in the mood of mother. It's different from the gopis. So in the same way, there are other ladies like that. There are other gopis also who share that mood of Mother Yashoda. Mother Yashoda, she has her associates, you know, the other ladies, the little elderly ladies, they will associate with Mother Yashoda. We'll be together and help each other so that's one way in which we can classify the, the gopis, that you, you have the gopis who are in Vatsalya Ras, but you've got other gopis who are more in the, what is called Anurakta. They have this loving feeling for Krishna, it's more influenced by Cupid or, or love. But among these gopis there's also differences. Some of the gopis are married and some are not. And now that's an, an interesting thing. But some of the gopis are married, married women. Some from the, and some, may, some, some of the ladies may even be from the city. They're not necessarily all from, uh, from uh, Vrindavan. They can be from other places. But generally we're, we're speaking about the gopis, the cowherd ladies. So some are married and some are not. And those who are unmarried, then there will be uh, different levels of perfection. Some of, some of the gopis, for example, they'll be at the level of sadhakas. Sadhakas, you know, in a sense, we're also sadhakas. We're trying to perfect our devotional service. And other gopis, they will be siddhas. They will be already perfected souls. There will be nitya siddhas, for example, eternally perfect gopis who come from the spiritual world to take part in Krishna's pastimes. And then there's another way in which one can get perfection, kripa siddha. Kripa Siddha, mercy, causeless mercy, one can get perfection. And then other, the other process, of course, is sadhana Siddha. So the sadhakas, they're doing their sadhana to become perfect. And in, in that stage of sadhana, there will be different levels of devotees, different levels of advancement. Some will be at the level of Kanista, some will be at the level of Madhyam, and some will be at the level of Uttama. And among the gopis, 
some will be some will be proda just like in Navadvip we have the deity of proda maya proda generally means elderly so some of the gopis their sen their seniority is due to their uh, elderly age and some are mukya mukya means uh, like they're more in the, the leadership position, they're recognized as being authoritative. Madhyam, intermediate. So we want to understand that all these different levels and different groups of gopis. Many, many, many gopis and so many different levels and so many different groups. And so we're just trying to understand how to be the servant of the ser a very small servant in some group of the gopis. And these different gopis, they all have their different particular services for Lord Krishna. I, I remember some some years ago, there was a there was a Mariji. She was actually from South Africa. And she had cancer, terminal cancer, and she was leaving her body. And she was a very qualified artist, very expert artist. So she was preparing, she was in Vrindavan, she had taken a house there in Vrindavan to finish her life. And uh, she was preparing herself for her spiritual position, for her situation in the spiritual world. She was envisioning that she could go to the spiritual world and she could take part in decorating Srimati Radharani and putting on the different decorations, maybe like on the hand and on the face, the different gopi dots and these kind of things. And she was med her whole meditation was for that particular service in the spiritual world. Very, of course, very, very nice, very exalted. She was a very advanced devotee. And many senior devotees, very senior Vaishnavas used to go and talk to her and spend time with her and prepare her and encourage her for going back to Godhead. You know, very senior, she was actually a disciple of His Holiness Giri Raj Swami. And Tamal Krishna Goswami used to talk to her and Govinda Maharaj, Bhakti Brinda Govinda Maharaj and like that different, very, very senior devotees, they would go and talk to her and they would encourage her in her meditation and in her endeavour to enter into the spiritual world to take up this service as a gopi in the spiritual world. Of course, there are many services there, making garlands for Krishna as well, we were talking about the Vijayanti garland, so these garlands have to be made. You have to collect the flowers. The flowers should be different colors and so on. And then cooking also. If you read the book, there's a book written by His Grace Satya Raj, Satya Raj Prabhu, and he writes about the life of uh, three great Vaishnava saints, about uh, Shamananda and Srinivasacharya and Naratam Das. So he described about Shamananda Pandit, how Shamananda Pandit, when he was staying in Vrindavan at the Gurukul of Jiva Goswami, he was, every day he was cleaning the Rasa Stala, the place where the gopis and Krishna danced Rasa Lila. Every day he would go there and sweep it and clean it. And one day he found an ankle bracelet, and it was a very, very beautiful ankle bracelet. He didn't know whose it was. And then some gopis, one gopi came, one lady came, young lady came, asking him, did you find a, a bracelet? Did you find an ankle bracelet? My mistress has lost her ankle bracelet. So Shamananda actually, he, when he gave the ankle bracelet, it was he, this was actually Radharani who was coming to collect the ankle bracelet, or it was a servant of Radharani coming to collect the ankle bracelet for Srimati Radharani. 
so it, it said that Shamananda, he used to do service for Radha and Krishna in his meditation, not only in his med he would actually, well in his meditation, yeah, but in his meditation, in his meditation he was cooking the milk because in Gokul, in Goloka Vrindavan there's a lot of milk and every day the milk has to be boiled. You have to boil the milk and then cook the milk down to make milk sweets and churn it into sometimes butter and things. So he would be cooking milk every day. But cooking milk is not an easy task when you don't have gas. When you're just using wood fires or uh, gober fires, it gets very hot. And his hand, he, would be med he would be cooking the milk in his meditation and his hands got all burned. His hands were all burned. And, but he, he, people never saw him do any cooking. The meditation was all done in his mind. In this way he was taking part in, in the eternal pastimes of the divine couple cooking milk in Goloka Vrindavan. And we see these kind of things also, Rupa Goswami, how he was also meditating on the pastimes of Radha and Krishna. That one time he was meditating on Radha and Krishna's pastimes when one uh, deformed Brahmana was walking past. And the, the, the deformed Brahmana took offence from Rupa Goswami's laughing. He thought Rupa Goswami was laughing at him. And because of that, Rupa Goswami was not able to enter back into his meditation onto the pastimes of the Lord. And Rupa Goswami wondered what had happened, why he couldn't enter into the Lord's pastimes anymore. And then he was asked by Sanatana Goswami, did you offend anybody? So Rupa Goswami thought about it, no, I didn't offend anybody, I but then he remembered how this Brahmana had come past and he thought, maybe this Brahmana somehow took offence from me. And so he found the Brahmana and sure enough the Brahmana admitted that, yes, I was offended, that you were laughing at me. But Rupa Goswami then explained to him, no, no, I was not laughing at you, I was in meditation on the pastimes of the Lord. And I was seeing how Krishna was splashing Radharani with the water and they were having fun and I was laughing, I was enjoying their pastime. And so then the Brahmin understood and so Rupa Goswami fell at his feet and begged forgiveness and the Brahmana also forgave him. And in this way Rupa Goswami could then continue his meditation. So this is how the, the, these great devotees would pass their time meditating and, uh, and their minds would be absorbed in the transcendental pastimes of Lord Krishna. Although they were in Chaitanya Leela and after Lord Chaitanya also, but within their mind they would be meditating on pastimes going on in Vrindavan, taking place not just Vrindavan in this world but in Goloka Vrindavan. So there are many different groups of gopis and these different gopis all have their different services. If you read Shivaram Swami's book, well he has a number of books of course, but there, I was thinking particularly of his book about uh, the Venu, Venu Gita. Is it the Venu Gita? What, what Gita is it? It's about Govardhan Hill. I think it's, it's the Venu Gita where Shivaram Swami is written. About it, he describes about each of the gopis and the different services which they each do. And we here we have here in Mayapur, of course, we have the astasakis, and each of these each of the astasakis, they each have their particular services for Lord Krishna, and they each have their own groups of gopis. So the the service is all assigned to different groups, to different gopis who serve the Lord in all different ways. So the, these gopis, they embraced each other when they understood they had some common emotions, different similar experiences, they were very happy and they could embrace each other. 
Yes. Any comments? Hare Krishna Maharaj, may I say something? Please, Maharaji. Um, I was appreciating how, what a beautiful mood they have. You know? They're not envious of others' progress or others' relationship with Krishna. They, they feel happy and uh, they want to share that emotion by embracing. That mood was very beautiful. I was appreciating that mood of yes, non Yes, that's a very important point. Thank you, Mariji, for bringing this up. The nature of the spiritual world is there is no envy. There's no bitterness or bad feelings anywhere in the spiritual world. We want to create that atmosphere by the Krishna consciousness movement. That there should not be any envy. Of course, we know Srimad Bhagavatam begins like that. And Lord Krishna also speaks about it in the Bhagavad Gita to Arjuna, telling Arjuna, because you're not envious of me, therefore I'm speaking this knowledge to you. And similarly, Srimad Bhagavatam begins that this Srimad Bhagavatam is for those who are free of envy. So it's very important for us to get give up that any envy and we, we see this wonderful feature among these pure devotees I mean, of course the gopis they're they're very very special devotees very great devotees but it's, we shouldn't just say oh well they're great devotees so you can't expect me to be like that <laughs> that's not very good we shouldn't think like that <laughs> Sometimes, you know, some, sometimes devotees, we're, we, we never give ourselves a chance. Uh, there, there, was, there was an example, one, one marriage, she was having difficulty in her marriage. And I, I suggested to her, I said, well, you know, I just read about Draupadi, that the, there was a description of all the different things which Draupadi did for her husbands. And she had five husbands, but she kept them all happy. Of course, we read about this in, in uh, Tenth Canto Srimad Bhagavatam later on, when uh, Krishna came to Kurukshetra with all of his wives. His wives were all very anxious to hear from Draupadi how she was so successful in keeping all five husbands happy. So I said to this Mataji, I said, you know, I'll send you this list which uh, Draupadi had, because Draupadi had you know, so many nice ideas about how to keep her husband happy and satisfied. But after I sent it to her, she said, Oh, oh I'm not Draupadi. <laughs> yeah, I'm not Draupadi, you know. <laughs> yeah, okay, you're not Draupadi, but still, you know, you, we can try, we should try to try to emulate these kind of activities. So similarly the gopis, we're, we're not gopis but we're encouraged to follow in the footsteps of the gopis. We want to follow that mood of the gopis, give up envy, the mood of working together with others, very important for us. This is the princi basic principles of Krishna consciousness, working together without envy. All right, we'll go ahead to text number seven. Now, text number seven, we see a gopi is going to speak. We haven't really heard from a gopi yet. Uh, we've heard Sukadeva Goswami speaking. And the gopis were going to speak, but then they became speechless. So now, somehow they've managed to get themselves composed again, and they're ready to speak. And they're going to speak to each other and describe topics of Krishna. And we're told that each of these verses is spoken by different gopis. From text number 7 up to text 19. Each of the statements are given by different gopis, different, they're each sharing 
their realization or their understanding of Lord Krishna and the situation there in Vrindavan. All right, who would like to read text number seven for us? Do we have some more nice uh, chanters? Yes, go ahead. Oh, Prabhu, can't hear you, Prabhu. With your mic. Can I hear you, right? Yeah, now I can hear you. And this text seven, right? Yes. Sri Gopya Uchahu Aksharvatam Palamidam Naparam Vidamaha Sakya Pashun Anu Vivishayato Vyasyahe Pakatram Rajesha Sukayo Anavenu Jushat Jushatam Jairva Nipitam Anurasta Kataksha Moksham. Thank you, Prabhu. Yes. Translation. Yes, Prabhu, translation? Yes, sir. The coward girl said, Oh, friends, those eyes that see the beautiful faces of the sons of Maharaj Nanda are certainly fortunate. As these two sons enter the forest, surrounded by their friends, driving the cows before them, they hold their fruits to their mouths and glance lovingly upon the residents of Vrindavan. For those who have eyes, they think there is no better object of vision. All right. Thank you, Prabhu. For those who have eyes, we think there is no greater object of vision. Right? Akshanvatam. Of those who have eyes. Aksham, akshanvatam falam. The fruit. <laughs> the fruit of these eyes. It should be simply to see Krishna. There is nothing worth seeing more than Krishna. Maybe you remember uh, Lord Krishna was coming from Vrindavan, going to Mathura with Akrura. And there's that place where Lord Krishna takes bath. Is it Akrura Ghat? Is that right? Is it Akrura Ghat? Just on the way to Mathura where Lord Krishna takes his bath with Balaram? Yes, Maharaj. Mm -hmm. yes, uh -huh. And then Akrura goes and takes his bath. And what does Akrura see when he goes to take bath? Do you remember? Uh, he's, uh, Lord Vishnu and uh, Ananta is the Yamuna. Yes. And when he comes back, then Lord Krishna says to him, he says to Akrura, did you see something wonderful there? He could see the look on Akrura's face, you know, Akrura comes back after taking his bath and Lord Krishna says to Akrura, did you see something wonderful there, Akrura? And what does Akrura say? You know, it's a, it's a interesting incident which I, I like to remember. Actually, at one point, we had artists in the Back to Godhead magazine and they, they did a, they did a, they used to do drawings of these different incidents and they had beautiful cartoons of these different incidents and, and they had a beautiful line drawing of Akrura coming out of the, taking his bath and coming to Krishna and Balaram and Lord Krishna asked him, have you seen something wonderful there Akrura? And Akrura says to Lord Krishna, My Lord, having seen you, then there is nothing more wonderful to see. One who has seen you, they have seen everything which is wonderful on the land, in the sky, in the water, everywhere. If we have seen you, then we have seen everything which is wonderful to see. So like that, the perfection of the eyes is to see Lord Krishna. 
So the cowherd ladies, these cowherd girls, they're describing like this. Uh, they're, they're, they've seen the beautiful faces of the sons, the sons of Maharaj Nanda. Now, is Balaram actually the son of Maharaj Nanda? What is the situation? Is Balaram also the son of Nanda, Maharaj Nanda? No, Maharaj. So why are they say, why are you saying like this? Why the gopis are saying the sons of Maharaj Nanda? Maharaj, can I say? Yes, please, Maharaj. Actually, we saw in the earlier uh, chapters that uh, Nanda Maharaj and Vasudeva are stepbrothers. Their father, uh, you know, they are stepbrothers. So, in that sense, uh, the generally the son, son's uh, brother's son is also taken as uh, their own, they also consider them as sons. So, in that sense, in that relationship, their uh, brother Ram is also Nanda's son. Huh. Because Nanda being the step, step brother of Vasudeva. Oh, right, yeah. Okay. And it's also mentioned, if you look in the Srimad Bhagavatam, it's mentioned in Chapter 5, text 27, there Sukadeva Goswami says that the mother and father, Yashoda and Nanda, called out to Balarama and blessed him. Oh no, that's, that's, that's the other text, that's the other reference. There's two, there's two references in the Bhagavatam. First of all, it's chapter 5, text 27, there Vasudeva is saying, he's telling Nanda Maharaj that you should think of my son Balaram as if he were your, as if, as if you were his father. Because Vasudeva's in jail. Vasudeva's in jail with, with the Devaki. They're the prisoners of Kamsa. But Nanda Maharaj is bringing up Balarama. He's there, Rohini's there in the home of Nanda Maharaj. And we remember also at the birth ceremony of Lord Krishna, Nanda Maharaj gave beautiful saris and ornaments to Rohini also. He didn't neglect her. He took care of her. And he also took care of Lord Balaram, who was a child of actually, she, he appeared from the womb of Rohini. Although actually originally he was in the womb of Devaki, but he transferred to the womb of Rohini, and he, so he took birth in the home of Nanda Maharaj. So Vasudev told Nanda Maharaj to think of Balaram as if he were your son. And then later on also in chapter 65, well that's way on in 10th canto, chapter 65, you've got a text there where Sukadeva Goswami says that the mother and father, Yashoda and Nanda, called out to Balarama, and blessed him. So Balarama was commonly known as Nanda Maharaj's son. Of course, it wasn't the actual Simino's son of, like that, but because he was brought up for such a so many years there in the home of Nanda Maharaj, it was like that up until they went to Mathura at the age of, uh, I think it was uh, 11, when Krishna went to Mathura for the wrestling match. That time Balarama also went with him. So they were always together. Uh, so the d gopis described him like that. But the acharyas point out there's a hidden meaning also. That The hidden meaning is that actually it, it's only Krishna playing the flute, that it's not actually Balarama also playing the flute but it's actually only Krishna playing the flute and it's the one face, it's not the two faces, but, <laughs> you know. Anyway, the Acharyas, he can read so many different meanings and different understandings into these verses. But here in our translation, which is given by Srila Prabhupada and quoted from the Chaitanya Charitamrita, it's described, the two sons entered the forest surrounded by their friends and they, they held their flutes to their mouths <laughs> and glanced lovingly upon the residence of Vrindavan. 
So this is Lord Krishna entering the forest of Vrindavan, glancing lovingly upon the residents of Vrindavan. We're, we're given a quote here by Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, has commented as follows, the gopis mean to say, O oh friends, if you simply remain in the shackles of family life in this material world, what will you ever get to see? The Creator has granted us these eyes, so let us see the most wonderful thing there is to see, Krishna. And we find this kind of topic brought up also in Gopi Gita later on. In Gopi Gita you have the verse where the gopis, uh, they, they say Lord Brahma was stupid, that he was this stupid creator, that he made these eyes which blink, so we cannot see Krishna all the time. And so the gopis, they very much desire to be absorbed in seeing Lord Krishna. And they, they want to see Krishna all the time. And they say, this, uh, the purpose of these eyes is just, they're just meant for seeing Krishna. They're not meant for anything else. Just the, the, the shackles of family life, this is the material world. That, the eyes are not meant for that. The eyes are meant for seeing the beauty. And we have also the nice verse about going to see Krishna. Uh, Rupa Goswami quotes that verse about, if you still desire to enjoy family, society and friends, then do not look on that boy Govinda who is standing in a threefold bending form playing the flute on the banks of the Yamuna. Because if you see Govinda, then you will never want to again enjoy family, society and friends. So in this way Rupa Goswami glorifies uh, seeing Krishna, appreciating the beauty of Krishna, using the eyes to see that wonderful form of Krishna. Krishna. Yes, Prabhu? Maharaj, that means that uh, in the spiritual world, they, they won't blink the eyes. <laughs> in the spiritual world, they won't blink. <laughs> well, that's probably true, Prabhu, because it's certainly that it's not Brahma who is the creator there. We don't know who is, uh, we, we don't hear about in the spiritual world, the gopis are cursing anybody for creating the eyes, but we hear about it in this world. We hear that Lord Brahma hasn't done a very good job here. That's the point. <laughs> we have to, whether or not we blink in the spiritual world, <laughs> that's an interesting thing. Uh, Okay, the gopis were aware that their mothers or other elderly, elder persons might hear their romantic words and disapprove. And thus they said, Akshamvatamphalam, to see Krishna is the goal for all persons and not simply ourselves. In other words, the gopis indicated that since Krishna is the supreme object of love for everyone, why couldn't they also love him in spiritual ecstasy? So, <laughs> very meaningful, very powerful statements given here. Generally, we, we do like to see, we enjoy looking and seeing things. We give a lot of importance to looking and being seen. There are other senses, of course, hearing, touching, smelling, tasting, but seeing is certainly one of the very prominent forces of uh, satisfying the senses. So, the gopis talk about being able to see Krishna The gopis are saying, those eyes which see Krishna are very fortunate. You see Nanda Maharaj's son, you're very fortunate. But don't the gopis get to see Krishna? 
Well, they get to see them go off in the morning. They get to see them go off in the morning into the forest. But that's it. They, they see them leave. And then they wait anxiously for them to come home in the evening. And they're waiting in the evening when the cows start. They hear the cows coming. There'll be some sound as they come because they, they blow their trumpets, and <laughs> blow their horns. They have different instruments which they take with them. And the cows, the cows also come. So the dust will be kicked up as the cows come to the village. Everyone knows, oh, they're coming home, Krishna's coming home. And everyone will be anxious and they'll all come out to see Krishna and all the cowherd boys, that they're coming home. So this is the pleasure of the spiritual world seeing the Lord and it's it's like a taste we want to actually taste the beauty of Krishna how to taste the beauty of Krishna by by seeing Krishna we should also want to see Krishna Prabhupada explains like that right we should have that desire that we want to see Krishna Prabhupada I was just reading Prabhupada was telling the story about the thief who heard that Krishna had many jewels. And they heard Krishna, that, that Krishna, his mother decorates him in many ornaments and jewels. So the thief thought, oh, I'll, I'll go there and find Krishna and I'll get his jewels. I'll get him to give me some of the jewels. And so the thief went there off to Vrindavan and because he was desiring to see Krishna, he went there and he was able to meet Krishna. Krishna actually appeared to him and, and he was talking to Krishna and making friends with Krishna but all the while his intention was he wants to get Krishna's jewels, he wants to get his ornaments from him. So he asked Krishna, so can I have some of your ornaments? But then Krishna understood his mind and Krishna said to him, Oh, no, no, I cannot give you my ornaments. My mother will be angry. My mother gave me these. And so then the, go the thief was a little distressed. He thought, I have to try another approach. And so he was trying and trying. And finally, then he, he was asking Krishna. Uh, and, and Krishna finally agreed. All right. You can have everything, take every, And at that time, then the, the thief surrendered and became a pure devotee of Krishna and took shelter of Lord Krishna. And so Prabhupada said, even you want to steal from Krishna, you should want to see Krishna. You should have that desire to see Krishna. So the gopis also, they also want to see Krishna. But they have a little problem. One of the problems is they're a little afraid to go close to Krishna because they're shy. They have their mothers-in-laws and sisters-in-laws, so they have to be careful. And they don't want to just walk up to Krishna. And, and they, they want to, they're, they're chaste ladies. So they're very careful about how they approach Krishna. Of course, Krishna, the face of Krishna gives bliss to everyone in the Vrindavan forest, even the birds and the beasts. What to speak of the gopis? But the gopis say, we're unlucky. We don't get any bliss because we have to stay at home. We have to stay far away from Krishna. We're very unfortunate. These other people who are in the forest, the different animals and so on, they get to see Krishna, they get to go close to Krishna. We don't get to see Krishna hardly at all. So we're very unfortunate. So the gopis have that quality, shyness and steadiness. So in this way, they can actually taste something of the ecstasy of seeing Krishna when they hear the sound of Krishna's flute, that sound of the flute of Krishna, 
enters their heart and it awakens their remembrance of Krishna. So seeing Krishna, that is what we want to actually desire. But the gopis say, yes, let us see, let us touch, hear and smell him. But then they say, how is it possible? We're, we're so shy. How is it possible we can do that? And if, if Krishna actually sees you, if he sees you from a distance, then he may release the arrow of his glance. The arrow, he may release the arrow of his glance and fire it at you. Right? We're all, all the gopis are all attracted to him and they're looking at him and then Krishna sees the gopi and Krishna releases the arrow of his glance. And when that arrow of his glance, when it strikes the gopi, then the gopi will become so agitated with love that they will forget their shyness in control. And then they will look without shyness on Krishna's face. So that's how it happens. The gopis have to look at Krishna and they have to get the glance. When Krishna glances at them, that glance from Krishna will release, that will, that will give them so much agitation. It will agitate their love so much that they'll give up their shyness. And then they will look at Krishna on his face without any shyness at all, without any uh, reluctance. All right, we'll go ahead. Text number eight. Who's going to read? Can I read, Maharaj? Please, Maharaj. Chuta pravala barhasta bakot palabja mala no prutta paridhana vichitra besho madhye vireja tur alam pashupala goshtya ranghe geta natavaro pachagaya mano. Yes. Translation. Dressed in a charming variety of garments upon which their garlands rest and decorating themselves with peacock feathers, lotuses, lilies, newly grown mango sprouts and clusters of flower buds, Krishna and Balaram shine forth magnificently among the assembly of cowherd boys. They look just like the best of dancers appearing on a dramatic stage and sometimes they sing. <laughs> yes, this is also a very interesting verse. Uh, the gopis may be worried about, well, how will we deal with disgrace? You know, it, it will be disgraceful for us if we're seen looking at Krishna and, we shouldn't go. But the other gopis said, no, we should go anyway. But then gopis said, anyway, Krishna is going with Balaram. So we cannot, our motive will never be successful because Lord Krishna is with Balaram. We cannot get Krishna on his own. But from far off, through the leaves of creepers, we will taste the nectar of his beauty and song and see him dance. In other words, the gopis, they want to see Krishna from a distance. They want to see him in the forest. They want to see Krishna through the different leaves and creepers and branches and trees. And they want to see how Krishna is singing and dancing. And said, so then after we see him, then we can quickly go home. So this is the idea. This is the idea of the gopis here. Just, they just want to see the best of dancers appearing on a dramatic stage. 
And then we have this amazing description of Lord Krishna, how he decorates himself with charming variety of garments upon which their garlands rest and decorating themselves with peacock feathers, lotuses, lilies, new-grown mango sprouts and clusters of flower buds. <laughs> so in this way Krishna and Balaram shine forth magnificently among the assembly of cowherd boys. So it's so wonderful, they, you know, very simple decoration, everything's provided by nature. Tender mango leaves and bunches of flowers in the hair and then the lotus buds in the right hand and around his neck, the garland and the cloth also, red, black and yellow, very colourful. Just like you, if you go to see some big movie star, you know, maybe they have these big shows, the different artists come. There was, I remember one time we had this one lady come to Hong Kong, she was doing, we, we arranged a program fundraising for a Hong Kong temple and we brought, it was, uh, uh, La, was it, what was her name? Sister of Lata Mangeshka. Ah, yeah, Asha Bosley, that's right. Yes, thank you, Prabhu. Yeah, but Sister Asha Bosley, she came there to Hong Kong to do a program. And so, you know, she's a, a very big name, you know, brought a lot of people who came to hear her. Uh, but the amazing thing was when she was singing, how many different times she changed, you know, different saris she put on practically every song, a different sari, you know. <laughs> it's uh, really amazing, you know. So here we have Krishna and Balaram, they're in the forest. And, you know, they're, they're cowherd people, they're simple people. And with all the cowherd people, village people, and how they dress. They don't have expensive jewellery. You know, when people get married, they have to have all this jewellery, so much jewellery has to be there and everything will be very, very costly. And here's Lord Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, with Lord Balaram, his own expansion. And how are they dressed? You know, it's, it's all the gifts of nature. Mango leaves and bunches of flowers in the hair, and uh, lotus and lily flowers. You know, not costly items, very different. <laughs> you know, th this is the mood of Vrindavan, this is the beauty of Vrindavan, that it, it's so simple, but at the same time it's so pleasing. Mm. So, Lord Krishna and Lord Balaram, they're there with all the cowherd boys and they're singing and dancing and everyone's pleased. They all appreciate the singing of others and they praise each other. They're happy, they praise each other. <laughs> Lord Krishna will say to them, no one can sing like us. You're just insignificant cowherd boys, what can you do? You can't do, you don't sing much. In this way Lord Krishna will inspire the other cowherd boys that, that they should sing, take part in this. So this is the, the, the beauty of Vrindavan Leela, it is so natural and simple, very different from Dwarka and Mathura where it's more opulent. And here we see Lord Krishna also as a cowherd boy, he's enjoying intimacy, loving relationships, singing and dancing with all of his friends and the gopis. They're, they want to see this, oh, they love to see this, because they don't get to see this. It's, it's only done in the forest. Okay, we'll go on, text number nine. Yes. No, no, no. Wait, wait, number nine. Number nine. Okay. Okay, please go ahead. Okay, what's number nine, Maharaj? 
Yes, number nine. Wow, shoo, very nice. Thank you, Maharaj. My dear Gopis, what auspicious activities must the flute have performed to enjoy the nectar of Krishna's lips independently and leave only a taste for us Gopis, for whom that nectar is actually meant? The forefathers of the flute the bamboo trees shed tears of pleasure. His mother, the river on whose bank the bamboo was born, feels jubilation and therefore her blooming lotus flower are standing like hair on her body. Thank you. Oh, yes, right. So this is very interesting. We're hearing more about the flute. What in a, what auspicious activities must this flute have performed to enjoy the nectar of Lord Krishna's lips and leave only a taste for us gopis? So the, the flute is described, there are different words for flute. We know there's uh, murli and vamsi and here we have venu. So Venu, the, when, when the word Venu is used, this is masculine gender. But other terms like Murli and uh, Vamsi, they're feminine. So the gopis are, you know, they, they feel this is outrageous, this is not proper. <laughs> that this flute is of, of masculine gender, but he's enjoying the nectar of Lord Krishna's lips. And the gopis say, that nectar was actually meant for us. Right? The nectar of his lips was actually meant for us. Krishna is a gopa and we are the gopis. So we were meant, we're the ones who are meant to enjoy that nectar from his lips. What audacity this flute has got, that he's taking all the nectar and practically there's no remnants, although here it says leaving some remnant, but I, elsewhere they say no remnants, practically no remnant, leave only a taste for us gopis for whom that nectar is actually meant. And then the forefathers of the flute, the forefathers meaning the bamboo trees, because the, the flute, it's a bamboo flute, so it's made from the bamboo trees. So the bamboo trees, they, they shed tears of pleasure. They're thinking, oh, this bamboo flute has become the flute of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, he's enjoying He's, he's doing service for the Lord. They feel so proud that this bamboo flute, their relative, has taken on this wonderful service for the pleasure of Lord Krishna. So the trees are there and they're shedding tears of pleasure. Their tears of pleasure are there in the form of the sap which flows from the trees. So the trees are related to the flute. And also the rivers are also related to the, to the flute. Now the rivers are female. So they're friends of the flute. The trees are male. They're like male friends. But the gopis say the flute, the rivers and the trees are all our enemies. 
The gopis are not happy with the flute. They like to take away the flute from Krishna and sometimes they do it. Sometimes they, they have the pastime where they will take the flute from Krishna and they will hide it. They won't give it to Krishna. It's, <laughs> it's a, a interesting pastime. So the flute has created a problem for the gopis, causing an ocean of disgrace. And that's described in this verse. So what piety did the flute do? First of all, we said it, it's an inanimate object. It's just a dead bamboo flute. But by, because it's touched by the lips of Krishna, Krishna can bring the inanimate object to life. So he has life. But what piety has he done? And what did it, what, why, should it, why should he be Krishna's wife? It took birth as an inanimate object. It was like a low birth, right? That's a low birth, just to be an inanimate object. It means you have no pious activities, very low born. But somehow this flute gets the nectar from Lord Krishna's lips. We cannot tolerate this, said the gopis. This is just, it's, no, it's just not right. It should be our gopis, it should be the gopis who have the right to taste that nectar. So the enjoyment, and then they say also, this enjoyment is done in an unmarried status, utterly alone. By thievery, the flute announces itself to be the real owner of that treasure. By bl what does the flute do? Blowing air. Just by blowing air. But this is not just regular air which is blowing. This is the sound of enjoyment that the flute gets by associating with Krishna. And we have to keep hearing that sound. The flute enjoys, in, he's enjoying that association with Krishna. And there's nothing left for us, practically not even a morsel. So this is the audacity of the flute. So this is why the, flute, the gopis are really not happy with the flute. The gopis say, those who have not performed pious acts act in the same way. You didn't, they didn't do any piety, so they do these things like that. Because the rivers see the flute enjoying the nectar of his lips, they become happy. And their happiness is shown, the happiness of the river is shown by the lotuses, the blooming lotuses. And they stand like the hair, like hairs on the body standing on end. In the same way the lotuses are standing out of the water, in happiness, in pride, at seeing the flute, enjoying the nectar from the lips of Krishna. And the trees pour out their honey. And they seem to weep in joy. Just like devotees, when they hear the glories of Krishna, sometimes they will also shed tears and their hairs will stand on end. So the sound of Krishna's flute affects also the rivers and trees in a similar manner. It awakens the bhava, awakens the ecstasy. So the gopis think, we should, we should get that flute. We should hide the flute. Where can we hide it? It does not, we, we don't want it get, we don't want that flute to get all the nectar of Krishna's lips. So this is Sanchari Bhav. And this is the Sanchari Bhav of envy, which is manifested in the gopis. <laughs> so we were speaking about envy and we were saying there's no envy in the spiritual world. But this is a very, very special example of envy between 
Krishna and the gopis, that the gopis have envy towards the flute, that that flute is taking all the nectar from Krishna's lips. So we want to hide that flute away from Krishna. And sometimes the gopis even, they'll hide it in their hair, and the gopis have big braids of hair, and they can hide the flute there in their hair. Krishna, Krishna is very anxious, where's my flute? He wants his flute. It's very dear to Krishna. In the Brihad Bhagavatam Rita, it tells about how Gop Kumar went to Vaikuntha and Dwarka, and in Dwarka he met Lord, Lord Krishna there in Dwarka. And when Gop Kumar came in the dress of a cowherd boy, and he had a flute, and when Krishna, who is there in Dwarka, when he sees Gop Kumar in the dress of a cowherd boy with a flute, then Krishna is really attracted. It really awakens something to him. Because Krishna had gone away to go to Dwarka, he, he has to be a different person in Dwarka. He cannot be a cowherd boy, he cannot play the flute. It's a whole different mood in Dwarka. But it's still Krishna, and Krishna comes to Dwarka. And when he sees Gop Kumar in this cowherd boy dress with the flute, then Krishna is very attracted and, and he gets a flute from Gop Kumar and Krishna begins to play the flute and he becomes overwhelmed. It's ecstasy for Krishna. But Krishna left the mood of Vrindavan behind to go to Dwarka. Of course, that's, a di that's Krishna's, a, Krishna, Vasudev Krishna and Shamsundar Krishna. Krishna's expansion. Shamsundar Krishna is always there in Vrindavan. And Vasudev Krishna is there in Dwarka. So we say Krishna is perfect in Dwarka, he is more perfect in Mathura, and he is most perfect in Vrindavan. So we are hearing about Krishna in his most perfect form as he presents himself to the gopis. Okay, are there any questions? Hare Krishna Maharaj, may I ask a question, Maharaj? Please do, Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, I had this understanding that um, um, inanimate objects generally relate to the Lord in Shantarasa, uh, but here we see uh, the rivers are um, embracing the Lord with the waves in a conjugal mood and the flute. Uh, so, uh, how do I understand it correctly, Maharaj? Well, Shanta is not, I, I, I don't think it's animate, inanimate objects, but Shanta can be things like trees and flowers and cows and like that. They can all be in Shanta There's uh, the, the, the different the different birds and so on, the deer also in Vrindavan, you know, they can all be in Shantarasa because Shantarasa means they appreciate the opulence of Krishna. They're attracted by the beauty or the opulence of Krishna, but they don't actually engage in any service. So that is the mood of Shantarasa. They, they're attracted, they, they like, you know, to see the beauty and to here and like that, but they don't actually do any real service for the Lord. So inanimate objects, they don't have that kind of consciousness to be able to appreciate these things. They have to have some conscious, there has to be consciousness there before we can appreciate the beauty, before we can be attracted by Krishna. So I don't think inanimate objects is the correct understanding of Shantaras. Maharaj? Uh. Yes, Prabhu? Um, cow, cows are also said to be in Vatsalya, you know, like cows, mother cows. <coughs> yeah, well, or not. It, <laughs> it, it depends. They may be, 
<laughs> you have to see what is, what is the mood of the cows, right? Are they giving milk? Do they give the milk it's like that, thinking they're providing milk? As, as, Vatsalya Ras means you want to protect your child. Vatsalya Ras, you know, Nanda Maharaj, Mother, they always want to protect Krishna. You don't see that with the cows. You know, they can't give protection. The cows are giving some service, no? Like giving them well, then that might be Dasya Ras, right? That would be Dasya Ras, if they're giving some service. But, you, I don't know, do they have that mood of giving service? You know, usually it's the cowherd boys who have to go and take the milk from the cows. Not that the cows personally come and give it. But, the, you know, Krishna and Balaram, they carry ropes with them to bind the leg of the cow so they can milk the cow. Sometimes it's described that they, they milk is born from their, from their others. Yes, sometimes because they're so fat, they've got so much milk, that the milk flows out of the other onto the fields, yes. Sometimes described like that. But that's not the mood of service, is it? It's not like they're giving service to Krishna, it's just that they've got so much milk that it's flowing, overflowing. But sometimes I heard also that in, in uh, Goloka Vrindavan that there's, there's no Shantaras there in Goloka Vrindavan, that everyone's in some kind of Madhurya Ras or something, or Vatsalya Ras or Sakya Ras there in Goloka Vrindavan. Of course, well, Krishna's servants are also there, Raktak, Patrak, Badrak, they're there in Vrindavan, so Dasya Ras must be there. Mm, we do. So where the cows fit in, yeah, could be Dasha Ras, yeah, Goloka Vrindavan. I mean, Santa Ras is not really there in Goloka Vrindavan. It's not going to be there. The example of devotees in Santa Ras is uh, said the four Kumaras. The Nanyugendras, the Shantaras devotees. Okay. Any other questions? No? All right, then we'll go on tomorrow night. Tomorrow night, we'll finish off this chapter tomorrow. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki. Go back to Vrinda Ki. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prabhu. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Prabhu.